Network of Saturn Programme, hosted by the GU Rocketry Society. Today, we'll be covering Sir Isaac Newton and how his three laws of motion govern the fundamentals of rocketry dynamics. The year 1687 marks the publishing of what's arguably one of the most important pieces of scientific literature, Newton's Principia Mathematica. Covered within its pages is an array of topics ranging from the orbits of celestial bodies, mass estimates of the Earth and Sun, hydrostatics, the foundation of modern day calculus, and of course, Newton's three laws of motion, which are still used to this day. The first law describes inertia. It states that an object at rest stays at rest, and an object in motion stays in motion unless acted upon by a net external force. This means that if there is no force acting on the object, then that object's velocity is constant. It also introduces a new term called momentum. This is equal to the mass of the object multiplied by its velocity. We can observe inertia in action by riding a bicycle. As you are riding, if you stop pedalling, you will continue to move in the direction you are going until an external force is applied, like braking or pedalling. We can also determine the momentum of our bike rider by taking the mass, 80 kilograms, and multiplying it by their measured velocity, 5 meters per second, to get a momentum of 400 kilogram meters per second. Now Newton's second law takes things a step further and explains what's going on right at the instant when we are pedaling the bike in our example, or when a force is applied to an object in more general terms. It does so by stating that the rate of change of momentum is proportional to the force applied. This is written as F equals dp by dt. In other words, when a force is applied to an object, we can figure out the change in momentum and velocity of that object if we know what the force is and for how long it was acting on the object. Because of calculus, we can then take this equation and change the notation a bit to something more familiar, F equals ma. And this shows that the force applied on an object is equal to the mass of that object multiplied by the change in velocity, also known as the acceleration. Our bike rider can help us visualise this. Once again, if we don't have any forces acting on us, our velocity is constant. But if we apply a force, our velocity will increase as shown by our bike rider starting from a stop. Finally, we have Newton's third law, which states that all forces acting between two objects exist in equal magnitude and opposite direction. More importantly, this means that there is a conservation of momentum, or that the total momentum of a system must remain constant. We can see this with two people sitting in rolling chairs. If person A exerts a force on person B, both people will move and have a momentum in equal and opposite directions. You can also try this at home with the garden hose. As the water is turned on, it ejects from the nozzle and you can feel the end of the hose exerting a force on your hand as it tries to move in the opposite direction. This is very similar to how a rocket nozzle works. Individually, each of the laws are really important. However, when used together, they can explain the dynamics of how a rocket works. When the rocket is sitting on the launch pad at rest, the first law tells us that we need some sort of force in order for it to start moving. The second law can help us figure out what that force needs to be in order to overcome gravity. So if we have a 60 kilogram rocket, we know that the acceleration due to gravity is 9.81 meters per second squared. We know that we need an engine capable of exerting at least 60 times 9.81 meters per second squared to get off the ground. But we'll need at least three times that, or three g's of acceleration, to get to a sufficient velocity. For this example, that would mean we need an engine with 1,765 newtons of thrust. But you might be wondering, how does an engine exert a force on the rocket? Well, that's where Newton's third law comes in. Similar to how a hose presses against your hand when it's turned on, 
a rocket engine works in a very similar way. The hot gases inside the engine expand and are ejected out of the nozzle. These exhaust gases travel very fast and sometimes they will have a velocity of multiple times the speed of sound. The exhaust gases are under very high pressure when they're in the combustion chamber of the rocket engine. As they are ejected through the nozzle, they have momentum going towards the ground. Next, Newton's third law tells us that the total momentum must remain constant, which means that the rocket's velocity must now act in the opposite direction, giving liftoff. It's a common misconception that the ambient air pushes on the rocket exhaust to give it thrust, but this isn't true. If it were, then rockets wouldn't work in the vacuum of space where there is no air. Luckily, rocket thrust is generated using Newton's third law and the conservation of momentum. This allows our engines to work in the atmosphere and in space. Thrust is just one of the four main forces acting on our rocket, the others being weight, lift and drag, which will be covered in further detail in a later episode on aerodynamics. You might be wondering though, in our example, the two seated people pushed against each other to get moving. So there must be something acting on the rocket to change its momentum. And this is true. It occurs by the exhaust gases being under really high pressure in the combustion chamber. This will all be covered in a further episode on propulsion. Yeah. Thank you to our components grassroots for sponsoring this video. Head over to designsmart.com for more information on everything we've covered. In the next episode, we'll be discussing the rocket equation and how we can tie together Newton's laws to figure out what does it take to get into orbit and why do rockets use stages. Thank you for watching this episode of the Suffolk Programme and we'll see you next time.